Yeah, how did I get into writing? Um, when I went to seminary, um, I couldn't afford to put myself through school. And my father, really to test me if this is really what God had for me, said, Stephen, I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to put you through seminary. You're going to have to work and God have to provide, which is fine. Um, I went to a school that the tuition was not supported by, underwritten by a denomination, and so it was very expensive. Um, I wasn't married, didn't have a wife to work to help me get through. So I tried to think how in the world, because if I, if I went and got an 8 to 5 job, or a, excuse me, a, you know, a, a 12 to 5 job, or whatever, I could do the math on this, whatever you would pay me per hour, or whatever, I, I can't even cover tuition, much less you know, put myself through school. So, I, I played college football. Um, I just decided I'm going to write a Christian football magazine. So, I, in God's providence, um, I was in Dallas, uh, became connected with Tom Landry and some of the Dallas Cowboys. And so, I wrote a magazine. Um, just out of sheer desperation to get myself through seminary. And, um, you know, it's hard just to create a magazine, and, and then I would sell subscriptions to it, and then I sold advertisement in it, and that's how I put myself through seminary. Well, once I had that set up, I mean, it's kind of, in some ways, fun. I just hung out with the Dallas Cowboys um, <laughs> back when they were the Super Bowl champions. Um, but that meant I had to write everything that went into this magazine. So I had Bible studies. I, had, I interviewed uh, Mike Ditka every week, Tom Landry, uh, Roger Staubach, uh, just et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And would just, I don't know, I just start writing everything that I could think of. I had a thing in there called Pigskin Prophet. And I would, I would pick the, the ball games, you know, and I was remarkably good. In fact, one man took my stuff, <laughs> unknown to me, and put a bookie out of business uh, just with my picks. Um, I told him, please, <laughs> please don't do that. Um, but it, it, it forced me to write, and I, I think you, almost, you have to have deadlines to be forced to learn to write well. I then went out to the Texas Rangers baseball team and um, got permission to write their magazine. And they sell it at the ballpark, and then I worked out deals with 7-Eleven and different convenience stores, and they would sell them in that. And, but, you know, you kind of create a monster, now you have to feed it. Um, and so I had to write all of that. And, and I, I wasn't a, an English major, I wasn't an English literature major, I was a finance major. Um, so, I don't know, I just always felt that I could write. I don't know why. Um, and so I just did. And then I've manuscripted all of my sermons, and that forces you to learn how to write better. And when I went to get my doctor of ministry, I went to study under R.C. Sproul, who is a phenomenal writer. I just read The Holiness of God and was drawn to him. And in my association with him, I had to write things and submit them to him for class, and he affirmed me that I could write. And, um, but he also taught me um, how to speak and how to write, um, the use of the English language, everything that my parents had tried to tell me to do that I, didn't, I, I just went in one ear and out the other. And he began to tell me how to use synonyms and how to do this and that and how to communicate and things about writing. It, it just, uh, it was a game changer for me. So, um, a, a certain ministry asked me to join with them to speak at conferences around the country and um, I took it to the elders, and they said, no, nah, we, we don't see you preaching in someone else's ministry during doing their thing. We would encourage you to just take your sermons and see if you could get them published. I mean, you are very unique, and you are you. So that's kind of how I got into it. 
So it's kind of like the real estate. Once you get one house, it's easier to move up to another house. And once you get one book, then it's easier to get a, another one going. So anyway, that, that's kind of how. But it's, it's kind of like with preaching. If you feel like you have the gift to preach, it, it would be helpful if someone has the gift to, to listen and to hear. And, and, and with writing, you may think you have the gift of writing, but others would need to really see value in this. But today in writing, it's, it, you have to sell your own books almost. And so it's like, do, do you have, have you created your own market for distribution? Um, and I mean, do you have a national radio ministry? Do you have, do you speak at conferences where they can sell the book? I mean, you, you're going to have to like, sell your own stuff. Um, so that's a huge factor, quite frankly, as well. I mean, you could be C.S. Lewis, but if we can't sell your book, um, it, it's a money-making deal for them. It's a ministry for us, but for them, it's a, they, they have to pay bills. I have a salary, so I, I can do this, you know, basically for nothing. Um, but they have to pay secretaries and editors and all the like. Yeah. In preaching, um, is it ever okay to make an application based off an assumption of the word? Well, in the scripture, some things are explicit and some things are implicit. Uh, that which is explicit is directly stated in the passage. That which is implicit is a reasonable assumption to assume based upon the text. And so there can be application made uh, off of that which is implicit, but uh, you need to be very careful. It needs to fit within an overall theology and not push the boundaries in some way. It, it, it would help if it would be readily apparent, someone looking at this text, that this is... Um, a reasonable application to make from this text. So without knowing the specific example, it would be hard for me. I, I would say I'm sure there are great abuses of that, and if it's reasonable to assume from this passage, then um, I would say to some extent it would be permissible. Someone else? Yeah. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. How does it work practically? I mean, do they have to come to the pulpit? And if they come, what do I do? Do I have to say too much there? Okay. okay. All right, the question is, if the expositor is to be an evangelist, do they have to come and hear you preach, or do you go to them? And then how do you lead them to Christ? Do they have to pray, pray the sinner's prayer? Is that a good restatement? Of the question? Okay, sure. Um, well, I think uh, it's not an either or, but a both and as far as people either need to come to the Word or we need to take the Word to people. And so we're to be involved in both. Um, I think it works out uniquely in each church with each man in each situation. And so there's not a one size fits all in every situation. Um, we must preach the gospel as we exposit the scripture. And I try to preach the gospel in each sermon that I preach. Somewhere in there, and many times it's at the end. I do not give a public invitation for people to get up out of their seat and come forward. But the entire sermon, in some way, is an invitation to their heart. And um, I try to work in, in a natural way, even if the cross or the gospel is not in this passage. Um, and I'll, I'll just give you an example. I'm preaching through 1 Corinthians 13 right now. I may have mentioned that. And there are the 15 virtues of what, seven of what love is, eight of what love is not. And so I'm, I'm slowing down. I'm preaching 15 sermons on each of the 15 virtues of what love is and what love is not. And I preached a sermon a couple weeks ago, um, Love is Not Easily Provoked. And I, and I thought, this almost sounds like a Methodist sermon. I mean, th this is just like going to all the world and smile. Uh, I mean, love is not easily provoked. And, and as I got up and preached that, um, even in my own mind, 
I was thinking, huh, I, I, I almost felt like a, a horse in the starting gate, and I'm just waiting. I almost want to get beyond this to the next virtue, and, and I feel just energy wanting to release myself, but I'm going to preach this passage. I'm going to pour myself in, and, and so I preached uh, love is not easily provoked, and I, and I really thought as I was preaching, this is just, a, this is just almost a, a neuter sermon. And at the end of the sermon, before I could even get out of the pulpit, a man made a beeline up to the pulpit who had visited, I think, one Sunday and began to talk to me, and I began to discern and detect that I, this, I think this man's lost and needs the Lord. And as I began to talk to him, <laughs> I, I said, what, what is it? that has struck your heart today? Why, why, are you, why did you get up out of your pew when the service is over, walk all the way up here and talk to me? And he said, um, he said I, I've, I, I, have ha I have a history of losing my temper. I've had it throughout my entire life. That, that is why I'm here by myself. Um, I, I, I have blown my stack and temper. I am so under conviction that I am not what I should have been, and then you said that God is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, that God is so much unlike me, that God is so patient with me, and I've been so patient with people. And as a result of that, I was able, I said, Look, come sit down in the front pew with me and, and talk with me for a moment. And I just said to him, what needs to happen in your life? And, and he said, I, and he stumbled to express it, that I need to give my life to God. And I said, can you think of one reason why you should not do that today? He said, I, I, I can't think of a reason. So I went back to the gospel and re-explained it to him. That, and, and he, as best I can tell, committed his life to Christ. Um. It doesn't have to be John 3.16 for people to be saved. I mean, you, you can buy a book with the conversion of all these people in church history and see the text that God used to win them to Christ. And it's, in, in so many cases, it's not what we would have picked out if we had been asked to preach an evangelistic sermon. But the power of the Word of God found them out, and they were birthed into the kingdom. So, um, in preaching the gospel... God is at work in ways beyond which we are even aware as we are preaching something as seemingly mundane as love is not, e is not easily provoked. But there has to be the gospel. I had the, uh, the privilege of being able to follow up with him, although I did preach the gospel at the end of that message. And, and, and the cross is God's patience and God's forgiveness being extended to you and how long-suffering God is. And then I talked about not everyone who hears the gospel the first time is immediately saved. And, you know, think of how long-suffering God has been to you to give you a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. So, we, opportunity, no chance um, under providence. Um, so, we do that. There are other texts are, that are explicitly evangelistic. We need to preach those as well. Do, do, do they have to pray a sinner's prayer? Well, no, not in the sense of Luke 18, verse 14, or verse 13, God be merciful to me, the sinner, but the essence of that has to be prayed to God. I mean, no one's just won into the kingdom by just thinking about it. I mean, in your mind and in your heart, whether it's spoken or whether it's not spoken, there must be a decisive commitment of your life to Christ, all that I am to all that He is. And again, when you read the Gospels, there's so many different evangelistic encounters that Christ had with different people, and there were all different ways Jesus drew the net with different people in different situations of their lives. But we must be casting the net and drawing the net as we're preaching through passages of Scripture. Going out into the community, yes. We are to go out into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. We are to go to them. The Great Commission is go, not sit and wait for them to come. It is to go. 
but it is, it's, a, it's a both and, because your church should be going, and a part of their going is inviting people and bringing people. And if you're mentioning the gospel, they're going to want to bring people. If you never mention the gospel, th they have no reason to bring people to hear you preach who are lost. They would have reason to bring believers, but not unbelievers, unless they know they're going to hear the gospel when they hear you preach. So, it's, either, it's not either or, it's both and. But it's going to be unique to where you serve the Lord and the doors that are open to you. But you do have one door that's open, and that's your pulpit. And then push on the other doors to see what opens up. Any, anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. Um, what would I preach to begin a church plant? Yeah. It, are there any people together yet? Yes, uh, new leadership. Just some small leadership. Five, ten, okay. Well, I think in some ways it would depend even where I was regionally because different parts of the country, I think, have different deficiencies and, and more glaring needs, and I, I, would, I would think that through. Um, I, I would certainly, I think, want to start with the person and work of Christ and be as essential, primary as I could possibly be. I, I would not want to start with something peripheral. I would want to start with something central. Um, I would not encourage you to start, you know, a nine-year study of the book of Matthew. Um, I, I, would I would encourage you to, to, to begin with something that you, that's bite-sized. You can get your arm around, whatever that smaller portion is. Uh, it could be a, a, a smaller epistle like Colossians or Philippians. Uh, it could be a section within the gospel. Um, I mean, my favorite book in the Bible is John, so I, I, I love the gospel of John. Uh, there are different things you can isolate in the gospel of John. Um, it would depend on where those believers are, how new of a believer they are um, to answer that. So again, I, I couldn't give a one-size-fits-all that like not having any idea where you are and the situation and who these people are for me to say, you really need to begin with this. I, I would have to be on site, my feet on the ground, knowing, reading, almost like Peyton Manning going to the line and, and calling an audible once you get to the line. I mean, I would have to read the situation before I could really give a good answer on that. Uh, and then the use of the Old Testament, I, I do um, think that we preach the Old Testament. And some of the most helpful things to me have been preaching the Old Testament. Um, I have a two-volume commentary on the Psalms where I've preached through all 150 Psalms, which took me like six years to preach through the Psalms. And that was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had in my life. I think an average preacher becomes a good preacher if you'll preach the Psalms. I think a good preacher becomes a great preacher if you will preach the Psalms. It'll just elevate your game. It'll make you a better preacher. When you preach, you don't want to sound like an email. You, and, and in that sense, you don't want to sound like an epistle. Uh, you want to sound like a sermon in the book of Acts, but you also need some of the poetic beauty and the figures of speech and the parallelism that is unique to the genre of Hebrew poetry. Everybody loves the Psalms. I, I go into the hospital. I read people's Psalms. I preach a sermon. I, I mean, a, a, a funeral. I'm inevitably preaching a Psalm. So, I love the Psalms. Uh, I've preached through uh, Job. I have a commentary on Job. Uh, that's powerful preaching. Uh, I can't imagine my life having not preached through just those two books. But I've preached through Proverbs. I've preached through major portions of Isaiah. Uh, recently, or not long ago, I preached through the first 20 chapters of Ezekiel, one chapter at a 
time. I've preached through Joshua. Um, I've preached through the Song of Solomon. I've preached through Malachi. Uh, a blockbuster ser- a series on preaching through Jonah. Um, I've preached through Daniel. Um, I, I am enriched for having preached through those things. I, I think variety is, is helpful and to, to preach the, some of the richness. So there are certain things that come out in the New Testament, uh, the, the bigness of God, the glory of God. I mean, so many times when I'm asked to preach at a, at a, at a conference, and you want to show up with a good sermon, um, I'll preach out of the Old Testament. Um, there's, a, there's a certain thunder that's in the Old Testament. So I, I, I don't want to be one-dimensional. And just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like some guys play golf with just a six iron. Tee off the six iron, play with a six iron, putt with a six iron. I mean, there's certain limitations to that. Uh huh. Biblical theology or systematic theology? Biblical theology, sure. Well, there are books you can read on biblical theology that help you think like a biblical theologian. Uh, Biblical theology would be to take uh, the theology of Moses and the Pentateuch, would be to take the theology of David and Solomon um, in the Hebrew poetry, it would be to take the theology of Paul, uh, it would be to take the theology of Peter uh, and trace that through individual books or clusters of books. So, you, for, for one thing, you would want to access those books where seminary professors have written those books and done an excellent job of helping you think through. Um, also, there are books that are written in honor of a certain man and, you know, 15 chapters and 15 different authors and Sometimes in those books there are extraordinary summaries, tightly worded summaries. That chapter is the theology of the Psalms, the theology of David, whatever, and, and, and it's broken out in the major areas of theology. So that's the main thing that strikes me. The other thing is tracing themes through entire books in the Bible is a form of biblical theology, and you, you trace a thread through an entire book in the, in the Bible. And even as you cross-reference, you, you begin with, within the context within that book, and then you begin with the entire book itself, and then you go to other books the same author has written, and then you move to other books other authors have written in that same portion of Scripture, and you keep moving your, your, your fence out until you take in the entire Bible, and then you've got systematic theology, but it's a biblical theology at each point along the way. So I, I would find those books and those chapters within books and be keen in thinking about that. There, there's a real joy of discovery for people to see certain themes that run through um, books in the Bible or their theology. I, again, I, I, I've, I've preached to the men in our church the doctrines of grace. And I began with Mo- Moses and just the book of Genesis, and I preached the five doctrines of grace just out of Genesis. Then I did it from Exodus to Deuteronomy, and then just worked my way, you know, just the synoptic gospels, just the John, Luke, what Luke had to say, what Peter had to say, what Paul had to say. You know, and R.C. Sproul said, I've never seen a book written like this. I mean, whenever I see the doctrines of grace, it's just the entire Bible on total depravity, the entire Bible on unconditional election. But you've done it as a biblical theologian, taking each section and tracing that out. Those were phenomenal studies that I did. And and Ligonier recently brought me down there, and they they brought in this huge film crew thing and got some people to sit in a room like this and for me to teach the Doctrines of Grace out of the Gospel of John and turn that into a video series, a DVD series. They put it on the radio. People, they say it's the best response I've ever had on someone other than R.C. And 
And, I mean, it just put a finger on a live nerve. People could actually see it within one book, within the Gospel of John. I'm getting ready to go to Brazil in October, and they've translated that book, Foundations of Grace, that I wrote into Portuguese. And I'm going to go down there and do the very same thing. I'm going to preach five sermons on each of the five doctrines of grace self-contained within the Gospel of John. And in some ways, it's simpler. People can see it contained within one room of a, you know, one book in the Bible, rather than it's just scattered all over the Bible to tighten that down to one book. I mean, you really do leave them with, there is the argument of, of Christ in His own words. I saw a hand over, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, it is hard work. Um, and up until very recently, I also taught Sunday school. So I had three preparations on Sunday. Um, well, I think we need more Bible preaching, not less Bible preaching. And I, I would not give up the Sunday evening service. And I would urge the church to be there. I think they need to be under the sanctifying power of the Word of God. Uh, I think it's the Lord's day, not the Lord's hour. And I, I think the day is the Lord's in a unique way. I'm not a Sabbatarian, uh, but I could kind of be close to being a Sabbatarian. I mean, I, th I, th I think the Lord's day is given to the Lord. And I, th I think that uh, some of the best sermons that I preach and some of the sweetest times of fellowship after church come on Sunday night. In our church, we take the Lord's Supper on Sunday night. And, and it's, it, it is, it's a powerful, powerful uh, service on Sunday evening. And I put it there, and, and I've, people have asked me, well, why don't you move it to Sunday morning um, so that more people can do it? And I said, well, one, there are lost people there on Sunday morning, and I, this is for God's people. Uh, two, it just, it, it's, a, it's a family meal. It, it's God's people coming together, and there are other reasons for that. But I'm... Um, I, I, I support Sunday evening. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, th there are different, for, for me, this is just my answer at the moment. There are different seasons in my life. And. At this point in my life, God has opened up certain doors for me to go places and preach, this being one of them. And so because I'm here, I'm unable to be at home and disciple men. But I'll be going to Brazil. I'll be, I just got back from Scotland. I just got back from Seattle. I just got back from... I preached out here a couple weeks ago. It's just a season in my life where I'm not able to do that, and I want to do that. Uh, and I did it for 20 years, over 20 years, and had a, f a Friday morning men's study. I had a Saturday morning men's study. I've done a downtown Friday noon Bible study, and that was always my fourth preparation for the week and poured myself into it. Um, I think every man has to know himself well and where his gifts are most effectively used, and I'm not a small group guy with two or three people. I, I, I don't do well in those settings. Uh, I'll eat lunch with you and we'll talk about ministry and there's a sense in which we're almost doing that now with each of the questions. But I, I've got to stand on my feet and there's got to be at least, I don't know, 10 people there that I'm able to kind of do what I do or, or you feel like you're getting a drink of water out of a fire hydrant with me. Uh, and it is too much and it's too forceful. But I, I have to know myself. But when I was a younger man, yeah, I, I did that weekly and saw, I never had a study like that, but that men were raised up, went to seminary, men were raised up, went to the mission field, became elders, became deacons, became our Sunday school teachers. I, I think the number one thing to try to turn a church around, I, I've been asked this numerous times, is,
you, you, you get a handful of men. You begin privately. You get a handful of men, you pour your life into them, and you teach them systematic theology in some way. And you, you, you get their mind and get their heart with you. Um, and you can begin to pivot the situation. Yes? Yeah, well, in First Thessalonians 2, Paul does that. He says that we are to be gentle as a mother and st strong like a father. And we can even see that from life, that it takes a dad and a mom to raise a child, and it takes the strength of a father, and it takes the gentleness of a mother. And all of that is merged into one in that First Thessalonians 2 passage. And we, we, we have to be mindful of it. We have to ask for God's grace. Um, and it's kind of like in baseball. Either you're good hit, bad field, or you're good field, bad hit. But there's only like two or three Mickey Mantles that excel on both sides. And pastorally, we've got to be as evenly balanced as we can be on that. But we all tend to be either right-handed or left-handed. But as John MacArthur has told me, and as I've told, shared with him at times, you know, I don't think I'm loving enough. I, I don't think I'm compassionate enough. And as he has said, those who are boldest in, in, in the truth actually are far, far more loving than, than what they realize. Um, and he went through different ways to describe that. But, um, I, you know, it's like the hot and cold water. It, it's hard to dial that in with balance. Um, my wife is very helpful, really, with feedback and telling me when I've been too strict or too stern, uh, one, in parenting, <laughs> two, in pastoring, and that's helpful to have that feedback. Uh, the more I read of Scripture um, and church history, um, these bold men were very tender out of the pulpit. Uh, John MacArthur, for example, in, in the pulpit, my goodness, I mean, he is as bold as a lion. Out of the pulpit, he is the single most gracious, kind man I know, whether in the ministry or out of the ministry. And it's, it's this thick skin, tender heart that the expositor has. And it's just a part of spiritual maturity and growing in grace. And it's not restricted to the minister. It's, it's in every Christian's life. Yeah. Anyone else? We really had, during the break up here, we, had, we, we, we really had the best Q&A up here <laughs> privately among ourselves. So I, I wish in some ways we could replicate that, but uh, we can't. Um, okay. I'm looking at the clock, two-minute offense now, okay? Um, <laughs> let's, um, let's talk about the models of expository preaching. We've talked about the meaning, and we've talked about the marks. And what I want to do is just do a general survey of the Scripture and isolate some examples of expositors that what we have been talking about is not simply the result of church history, that it is the result of biblical example, that this is rooted and grounded in example. At the end of the day, we want to do what's in the Bible. Church history simply affirms and motivates and inspires but at the end of the day, we want to do what we see found in pages of inspired Scripture. So, l let's just begin in the Old Testament and the first expositor. And this expository preaching did not begin in the 20th century with Martin Lloyd-Jones. It did not begin in the, in the 19th century with Alexander McLaren. Um, it didn't begin in the 16th century with Calvin and Luther. It, didn't, it did not even begin with the apostles 
in the first century. It really began with Moses, who was the first expositor. And I want to look just for a moment in Deuteronomy chapter 1, which is, as you know, the second giving of the law to the new generation that has been born in the wilderness. And in Deuteronomy chapter 1, we discover that the book of Deuteronomy is in reality a Bible conference. It is in reality a series of sermons. It is a series of Bible sermons. Moses is the author of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, as well as Deuteronomy. And at this point, we are in the last weeks of Moses' life. The first four books of the Pentateuch have already been written. I think it is unreasonable to assume that he wrote the whole thing on his deathbed, but that he wrote it, those first four books, during the 40-year wilderness wanderings. And much of it being supplemented as that scene is unfolding. He comes to the end of his life, and... The book of Deuteronomy was preached probably in a one-month period of time. It is probably the last weeks of his life. God has told him he will not enter into the promised land. He is to go up into the mountains and die. In chapter 31, there will be the handing of the baton to Joshua, who will lead the nation into the promised land. And Moses is allowed to preach what is in reality his farewell sermon to the congregation. Um, And we read in Deuteronomy 1, verse 1, these are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel across Jordan. That means he's on the east side of Jordan at Moab, that we would call Transjordan. And in verse 3, it came about in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had commanded him to give to them. So, he is simply a mouthpiece for what God has given to him. And by this point, he has written it and he has recorded it, at least the first four books um, in the Bible. At this point, the the book of Deuteronomy has, has not been yet recorded. We know the end of Deuteronomy could not have been written by Moses because it's his own death. He's good, but not that good. (laughs) And so someone is there helping in the transcription of what Moses is saying and what Moses is preaching in his farewell sermon. There are probably three sermons that come together to comprise the the majority of the book of Deuteronomy. But as we come to verse 5 in Deuteronomy 1, we read, or I guess one more comment about verse 3, again, that what he spoke was what God had commanded him to give to them. So in that sense, we already have this expositor feel. The message does not originate with himself. He's not drawing from his own well, but that he is conveying what had been given to him. In fact, what had been commanded to him. So he is, there is a mandate upon his life. He is a man uh, under orders before God to now preach what has been given to him. And so we read in verse 5, across the Jordan in the land of Moab, immediately before they cross Jordan, Moses undertook, now note the verb, to expound this law. That's what the expositor is. He is an expounder of the Word of God. And at this point, the law has been written down. It has been recorded. There is precision in the recording of what has been said. To expound this law. We know the Ten Commandments have certainly been written down because God Himself wrote it with His own fingers in tablets of stone. Now, this word expound is is a very rich word. Ba'er, transliterated B-A-E-R, sometimes it's B-A-A-R, 
Ba'er, ba'er means literally to make clear, to make distinct, and most of all, to make plain. It, it comes from a, a root word which means to dig. And the idea is digging into the word and bringing to the surface for all to see what is in the soil. You, you dig it out and you hold it up and you set it forth for others to see. That's really the idea of exposition. It is to expound the law. At this point, that's all there was, was the law. There are no prophetic books. There's no poetry. There's obviously no gospel. There are no epistles. So it's the entirety of what God has entrusted. The same word is used in Deuteronomy 27, verse 8, and is translated very distinctly. It, it means to make something very distinct. It's crystal clear. And behind it is the idea to explain, to take that which is obscure and make it very clear through an explanation. It means to make evident. And what Moses is doing in the book of Deuteronomy is he is stating the text, he is explaining the text, and he is applying or exhorting with the text. But this word in verse 5, it means to make clear. Now, William Perkins, who was a great Puritan, wrote a book entitled The Art of Prophesying, which was the standard book on preaching in the Golden Puritan Age. And in that book, The Art of Prophesying, kind of like the 1 Corinthians 14, prophesying, meaning preaching, Perkins writes, preaching must be plain. It is a byword among us, he writes. It was a plain sermon. He then says, he then writes, I say the plainer the better. That's not an insult for someone to say, that was a plain sermon. If by that they mean boring, that is an insult. <laughs> but if plain means you have made that very plain, William Perkins says, well, then the plainer, the better. So that's the word expound. So Moses is expounding the law. He is explaining the text. Now, Come to chapter 4, Deuteronomy 4 and, and verse 1, and we, we bypass really the historical walkthrough of how they got to where they are at this moment. In ver the rest of Deuteronomy 1, 2, and 3, it's a historical survey of from the Exodus to where they now stand at, at Moab. But when we come to verse 4, verse 1, Having laid the groundwork with the historical background, Moses now really gets into the expounding of the text. And he says in Deuteronomy 4, verse 1, Now, O Israel, listen. There's a sense of urgency about this. He's impassioned. Listen to the statutes and the judgments. Those are both designations within the law. Uh, the word statutes literally means engraved, like engraved into stone, uh, inscribed or etched into stone, and it speaks of the permanence of the law. It speaks of the binding force of the law. It, it's not written on a leaf that can just be blown away. It's etched, as it were, into stone. It, there is a, a stability, a longevity, uh, a gravitas, a weightiness about the law of God. It is etched into stone, the statutes, the specific teachings, the specific requirements. And then when he says the judgments, he, he is saying that these are more than just mere suggestions or options, but that there are portions of the law that will bring 
the consequences of disobeying the statutes. There will be judgments upon the one who does not follow the statutes. Now continue to read. Now, O Israel, verse 1, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you. That's exposition right there. He is expositing and expounding the statutes and the judgments that have already been entrusted to him from God himself. He is teaching the Bible right here. What has become to us at this point the first four books in the Old Testament, which I am teaching you, note what's next, to perform. So there is an exhortation based upon the teaching for you to do something and for you to now obey and to do this which I'm teaching you to do. That is what expository preaching is. It is to read the text, it is to teach or explain the text, and then it is to exhort people to do it and to follow it and to put it into practice, put it into action in order that you may live. And he is underscoring the importance of this. Look at verse 2. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you. There, There is this commanding authoritative force about expository preaching. He says, I am commanding you because it is the command of God. It's not my command. It is God's command. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it. This speaks to the sufficiency of Scripture. Nothing needs to be added to it. Nothing surely is to be removed from it. It is self-contained. It is sufficient. All that is needed and all that is necessary for godliness is contained within it. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. You are to keep it, and I'm commanding you to. He is not a hyper-grace teacher. Obedience is obligatory. And you are commanded by God to keep his word. I am so weary of the 20-somethings and 30-somethings who today want to so emphasize grace, glorious truth that it is, that there is an antinomianism as though we can live our Christian lives without any commandments of God. Nothing can be further from the truth. That is delusional. Look at verse 5. See, I have taught you statutes and judgments. That's what an expositor does. You teach the Word of God. I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. The word teach in verse 5, taught, I have taught, that is explain the text. And then he says, God commanded me that you should do this, that is exhorting with the text. That's what expository preaching is. And when we come to verse 5, we will see that he reads the text. He reissues the Ten Commandments without any commentary, without any explanation, just the sheer straightforward reissuing of the text. It, it's like when we stand up on Sunday and ask everyone to take their Bibles and turn with us to Psalm 90, and you read the Word of God. That's what Moses will do in Deuteronomy 5, as he reissues the law to this new generation. But as he does so here in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 5, he is teaching it, and then urging them to do it, to to follow it. He repeats it in verse 6. So, keep and do them. The emphasis is upon the application, putting into practice, the, 
the keeping and the doing. He's not just teaching, but he is also exhorting. And it's interesting in verse 7, he says, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as to the Lord our God whenever we call on Him? And the backdrop to this well, is really in verse 12. Look at, look at verse 12. Then the Lord, he's recalling back at Mount Horeb, when the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire, you heard the sound of voice, uh, sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. What a contrast with the dumb idols of the nations. The dumb idols were seen, but could not be heard. Israel's God is the flip-flop. He cannot be seen, but he can be heard. And when we carry out our ministry, it is we are, we are those who project the words of God who cannot be seen, but who has been heard. And that voice has been recorded in His written Word. So as we stand to preach, we, we do not need visual imagery of God who cannot be seen. What we do is we take the book which contains the voice of God and we cause the God, the invisible God who cannot be seen to be heard. We give voice, we give projection to the voice of God. So, I don't need to be putting up pictures in the worship service. God is not a God who is to be seen. He is a God to be heard. And the primacy of the preaching of the Word of God. Verse 8, just above that, or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today. It was an expression of the goodness of God to this nation that God would give them statutes and judgments. Every time God says, do this, He is pointing into the center of His good will and plan for His people. Every time says God, God says, do this, God is saying, help yourself to blessing. And when God says, do not do this, God is saying, I love you so much, I do not want you to self-destruct. Stay away from this. It's not arbitrary. It is an expression of the goodness and the genius of God. Instead, do this. When a parent tells a child, do not put your hand on, a, on an oven that is orange, red, hot. Is that parent unloving? No, that parent is so loving that he does not want the child to literally singe their hand. When a parent says, do not lick your finger and put it into the electrical socket, and play Christmas tree. Do not do that. It is not the parent like saying, you know, I just don't want you to have any fun around here. It is the parent saying, I do not want you to bring great harm upon your life. Every one of the prohibitions comes with the goodness and the genius of God. And every commandment is to help yourself into the center of God's will. Verse 13, Deuteronomy 4, verse 13. So he, God, declared to you his covenant which he commanded you to perform. That is, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. The Lord commanded me. In other words, I'm under mandate. The Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments. God has commanded me to teach you His Word that you might perform them in the land which you are going over to possess it. So, Moses is the first expositor. He is a man under orders. He is a man with a 
a mandate that has been laid at his feet. God has commanded him to take the word that God has given to him and to go to the people and to teach it and to expound it and to make it clear and to make it plain and then to urge them and even command them to do all that is recorded in his law. He yet goes further in verse 15. So watch yourselves carefully. He calls for self-examination, uh, to watch over your own soul, to watch over your own life. It is critically important that you watch over your heart, for from it flows the issues of life. So watch over yourself carefully, verse 15, since you did not see any form on the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb from the midst of the fire. It is critically important that you examine yourself because the one true God is a speaking God, and so what He says is of great importance. You cannot see Him, so He cannot gesture to you. He can't point the way to tell you to take. You must hear His voice to know the way and the path you are to follow. And that path has been clearly delineated and marked by His written Word. So the preacher is to take the written Word of God and make it plain and clear to the people so that they will know the path of obedience that they are to pursue. Verse 21, Now the Lord was angry with me on your account and swore that I would not cross the Jordan and that I would not enter the good land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For I shall die in this land. I shall not enter the Jordan, but you shall cross and take possession of this good land. This is Moses' farewell sermon. And when you preach your farewell sermon, you don't want to preach a peripheral message of secondary importance. You want to preach the message that is of greatest importance. And as an expositor, Moses preaches to them the Word of God, teaches it, and it calls them to keep it. In a very real sense, verse 21 and 22, Moses is doing what Richard Baxter said all preachers must do. We, we must preach as a dying man to dying men as never to preach again. Moses is a dying man who is preaching as to never preach again. So verse 23, so watch yourselves, he's saying to the people, that you do not forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made. Verse 24, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Verse 31, for the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant which your father, which your father, with your fathers, which he swore to them. So he just, in this entire fourth chapter, reinforces those three main bullet points. Read the text explain the text, exhort with the text. You come to chapter 5 very quickly, and, and we see actually the reading of the text. Um, verse 1, Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel. And the word hear there implies uh, a hearing with the intent to obey. In the Hebrew, to hear and not to do is not to hear at all. To hear and to do is to actually hear. Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the ordinances which I am speaking today in your hearing, that you may learn them and observe them carefully. This in embryonic form is expository preaching. This is the prototype for expository preaching. And so beginning in verse 7, he now gives the reading of the text. In essence, he reissues the Ten Commandments. Verse 7, you shall have no other gods before me. Verse 8, you shall not make for yourself an idol. Uh, verse 9, you shall not worship them. Um, verse 11, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, etc., etc., etc. Moses has nothing to say apart from the Word of God. And the introduction to the sermon was just the historical background. In, in chapters 1 through 3. 
We come to chapter 6. It says, Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you that you might do. Again, there, there, there in seed form is expository preaching. There in the initial elementary form, the ABCs of expository preaching, Moses is modeling what you and I will do for the rest of our lives. We will read the text, we will explain and instruct with the text, expound it, make it very clear, and then we will exhort with it such that people will do it, and it will come with an authoritative voice. We will remind them that this is the commandment of the Lord. In verse 2, the long-lasting effects of this for them, um, and so that you and your son and your grandson, nothing is going to change from this generation to the next generation, and nothing will change then to the next generation. This is all timeless. It is transgenerational. That all of you might fear the Lord your God to keep all His statutes and His commandments, which I command you. Verse 3, O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, and it will be well with you. The great Shema, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Verse 5, the succinct summary of the entire law, all of this is to direct and point the heart to love God. It's, it's not a mamby-pamby, willy-nilly kind of existential goosebump feel. No, the, the point of the law is to direct our heart to God. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. And he is saying it's not just the external conformity outwardly to the law. It must flow out of the heart, a heart that loves God. That is why you should have no other gods before you. How could you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength when you are loving other gods? You would have a divided heart. You would be half-hearted towards God. If you were to love God with all your heart, you would have to keep the Ten Commandments, which begins, you shall have no other gods before you. How could you love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength if you took the name of the Lord your God in vain? He obviously means nothing to you that you mean nothing by His name, you speak it in vain. The word vain just means empty, nothing. You cannot love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind without being in compliance to these laws. How could you love God if you didn't observe the Sabbath and set aside a day for you to worship Him and to give your life and your heart to Him and to sit under the ministry of His Word? How could you love God if you fail to honor your father and mother who are telling you about God and pointing you to God? You, you can't love God and live in contradistinction to what your mother and your father are telling you to do. You need to honor your father and mother, and especially in their instruction, to point you to God. Uh, how can you say that you love God if you, do not, uh, if you are stealing from one another? You're not trusting God. You're not looking to God to meet your needs. You are simply trying to short-circuit trusting God by taking from others that which belongs right, which God would provide for you if you would trust Him. All the way down to the Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet. How can you say you love God when your heart has other lovers inside your heart? How can you say that you love God when you love God the things of this world more than God. This is a part of what Jesus was doing in Matthew 5 when He said, you, shall, you, you have heard that it is said, but I say unto you, Jesus is actually just expounding the law in much the same way that I just did, giving the true interpretation of the law to direct your heart to love God. To seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. So, the law is so important, he says in verse 6, these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Verse 7, you shall teach them. Verse 8, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and on your forehead. 
Verse 9, you shall write them on the doorpost. In other words, I want the Word of God constantly in front of your eyes, and I want it in your heart. When you wake up, I want you to see the Word of God. When you walk out of the house, I want you to see the Word of God. When you walk back in, I want you to see the Word of God. When you lay back down to go to sleep at night, I want you to see the Word of God. Just like what John MacArthur said a couple days ago, uh, he, he doesn't even have to extend his hand very far, but the Word of God is right there in his house. They are to be Word-centered living. Well, that's going to necessitate word-centered preaching and word-centered teaching. So, verse 12, watch yourself that you do not, do not forget the Lord, etc. Well, I think we stop right here. To me, it's abundantly clear what Moses is doing. He's expounding the Word of God. It's very easy for me to stand in his sandals. It's very easy for me, given what God has called me to do, to stand shoulder to shoulder with Moses and get in line behind him and say, I will do in my ministry what Moses did in his ministry. And so as we would be tempted to look at other ministry models out there, that are not text-driven, that are really just VBS for adults. Let us remember Moses. He has, he has thrown the gauntlet down. He has set an example for us that you read the text, you explain the text, you expound it, you make it clear, and then you urge the people to do it, to follow it, and it will be well with them. If they do not, it will not be well with them. So the consequences will come in response to the choices that they make. And even at that, there is a pressing of the will, a challenging of the will. You decide. I set before you life and death. I set before you blessing and cursing. <coughs> Choose which way you will go. That is real preaching. It is so God-centered as well. Well, I want to close in a word of prayer. Is today Thursday? Wow, it seems like we just started. Um, you can all come home with me if you want, and we'll, <laughs> we'll just kind of keep it going. We'll stay up all night with a flashlight and look at our Bibles. Um, just one more day left. I, w I wish we had more time together. Um, I will look forward to being with you in January, and we'll talk about the mechanics, the practical getting alone in the study with the books, pull this stuff together. But until then, we have one day left, and that'll be tomorrow. So I've got one other text I want to take us to in the Old Testament, kind of like Moses here. I want us to look at Jesus. I want us to look at Peter. And I want us to look at Paul. And see, did they break rank with what? Moses began. Did they go in a different direction? Did they reinvent ministry? Did they reinvent preaching? Did they come up with a new way to preach to get the message across? Or did they simply follow the pattern that is to be timeless in every age? in every generation, in every place. And I think what we will see is there is a thread running through the entire Bible and that it matters to God how His Word is handled and it matters to God how His Word is preached. It's not our book. It's His book. And He has the right to tell us how His book is to be preached.